Hey there. In this video, we're going to cover one of the most important topics when it comes to mixing, and that is panning. Now, in the early 1930s, a bunch of blokes in white coats figured out that two speakers with varying information sounded way better than just the one speaker which everyone was using in that period. And that's right, people were only listening to music through one speaker. Now, there was a race to figure out how to make recorded music sound better when it was played back through stereo systems. And this involved things like panning and frequencies. The more frequencies that could be recorded and played back, well, the better the quality of sound. In other words, they were figuring out how to produce a better audio landscape. The frequency section of the audio landscape is everything from low sounds through to really high sounds. Now, back in the 1930s, a lot of the research was based on orchestral recordings, so very rich recordings, and sometimes the orchestra was backing a famous singer. So the challenge was how to get the double basses and the tubers and all those instruments that cover the low frequencies to sound realistic, and also how to ensure that they didn't drown out higher or quieter instruments like flutes or oboes or violins. As you will no doubt be aware, humans have two ears, which allows us to experience spatial awareness, if and when we actually use them. When I'm out in the park, I can generally hear where the birds are chirping and singing, and I can turn around, and it's likely I'm going to see them. We can hear a car approaching from behind and generally know where it's approaching from. Now, as I've already mentioned, Prior to music being played through two speakers, there was only one, and quite often, only one microphone. Think of that old wind-up record player with the giant metal horn coming out of the top of it. Gramophone. The general idea with this early research was to separate the recorded sound into more than one speaker. So the sound would be spread, and listeners could imagine they were actually sitting in front of a real orchestra. So the violins are on the left and everything is placed from the left around to the double basses on the right. As technology advanced and they got better at placing microphones in certain positions, they realized there was another problem. Messing with where different sounds sat in a stereo mix could really confuse a listener. For example, having the lead vocal panned all the way around in your right ear just didn't sound right. Or having louder low sounds panned all the way around to the right or the left really took the focus from other things that were going on in the recording, like the lead singer, for example. In simple terms, they were searching for the best way to paint a picture that had the highs and the lows placed correctly and the information from left to right placed in a secure manner. So all the important parts of this picture were easily consumed or were pleasing to our ears. In other words, they needed to find the right balance. And finding the right balance is the key to panning correctly and forming a nice, even stereo image. Most listening environments are stereo, so that means that it's going to sound nice on headphones, through your stereo, in your car, and if you get lucky, on the radio and perhaps even on TV or in the movies. All doors have a stereo output or even multiple stereo outputs, which is really handy if you're mixing in surround sound for say cinema or even things like computer games. That means that the output or the stereo output will have a left and right. And of course, in between that is the center. And this gives us the choice to decide where certain parts are going to sit in between the left and the right. Before I discuss that, let's cover some basics regarding track types. So you may have noticed that in a door you've got an option to create a mono track or a stereo track. Mono tracks are anything that only has one output, like a microphone, for example. You would often only use one microphone for a lead vocal, so that's a mono track, or an electric guitar that's plugged straight into your door. A bass guitar is almost always mono. Stereo tracks tend to be things like you know, synthesizers or pianos that have been mic'd up with two microphones, or 
electric guitars that have two microphones placed on the cabinet. Or maybe it's two microphones on a choir or backing vocalist. Both mono tracks and stereo tracks can be panned in a door. And a mono track can even be sent to a stereo signal, like a group track or an effect track. You can even convert a mono channel to a stereo channel and take advantage of stereo plugins. So let me make up the point. A stereo track does not mean a track is better. It just means there are two sources or channels rather than one. It's better for, say, a synth pad sound because there'll often be different information on the left and the right, meaning the sounder is fuller and more interesting. Let me quickly show you how panning works. So I simply select the track I want to pan and then I go to the balance panner and move it left or right. I can also do the same in the mix console. The panning pot or knob or slider is almost always above the channel volume control. Now, this has been the case on mixing consoles for decades and decades, and it's still the case today. When the panner is dead center, it almost makes us believe that there's only one speaker sitting right there in front of us. You should always listen to your final mixes on headphones before you finish, because decent headphones give us a much closer or clearer stereo image. There's also a number of tools we can use over a master channel to check our final stereo imaging. Aside from a few decades of some pretty serious drug consumption in the last century where there were very loose rules on what should or could be panned where and when, there are some basic ground rules when it comes to panning. And look, they're all based around pretty much on what shouldn't be panned. So what should be right dead here in the center. Now rules are made to be broken and I'll run them through you or by you and you know, I'll leave the creative direction up to you. If you're recording drums, then your kick drum is generally straight down the middle. And by that, I mean your panner is dead center. Don't touch it. Leave it alone because it just sounds weird and imbalanced to have such an important part of the production anywhere other than center. You really want to be feeling it, like right here. And that's usually the case for the snare drum as well. I'd leave that in dead center. If you're using a drum plugin, then you'll often find that the mix is usually spot on in terms of where the drum parts are sitting from left to right. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Leaving the pan at dead center is also the case for another really important instrument that fills part of the lower frequency spectrum, the bass. So generally, you're going to leave that dead center as well. Just bear in mind that if you're using a software synth, your synth bass line may very well be stereo, and that's perfectly okay. Just leave the panner alone. Unless, of course, you're after some kind of crazy effect. Lead vocals are something that, as I said before, just sound weird if they're not centered. So leave that right in the middle as well. And that makes sense because the lead vocal is really the most important part of our track. And we're really used to hearing them right in the center. So it just sounds weird having them anywhere else. I've talked about using stereo width to provide space. So maybe let's consider some of the things we might want to actually pan to the left or to the right. I've got some lead vocals here. In fact, I've got lots of them. There are some lead vocals and some lead vocal doubles. Now, I could very well add some interesting effects like chorus and distortion to the doubles and pan them slightly. More importantly though, how do we get all of the backing vocals to fit in a mix around that lead vocal without drawing the lead vocal out? There's only one lead vocal melody, and often there are lots of harmonies and oohs and ahs. Well, there's maybe a few less oohs now that Coldplay aren't releasing songs every month. But it can be a pretty complex mix. So I'm going to start panning some of these backing vocals to the left. Some of them all the way to the left, and some of them only half the way to around about 9 o'clock. Then I'm going to pan an equal number all the way over to the right, and pan some more over to three o'clock. And this gives me a nice balance and it's pushed all those backing vocals away from the actual center, leaving lots of room for my lead vocal to push through. You need to consider which parts you're panning. So sometimes it's best to get doubles of every part. For example, 
two or more takes of a singer singing the first harmony line, which you can pan equally to the left or to the right. Then get two more takes of another harmony and do the same again. I sometimes like to grab an octave double of the main vocal, so that's exactly the same vocal line, just up or down an octave. And I don't need to necessarily pan them because they might add weight to a lead vocal in a chorus. Once again, the key is balance. Make sure you're balancing backing vocals and it's a really important job. Have a listen to all these vocals that I've got here centered. Holding on to me, I just can't believe. And now let's have a listen to them all panned. Holding on to me, I just can't believe. Holding on to me, I just can't believe. Electric guitars are just screaming out to be panned. And my general rule with electric guitars is if there's a big chugging sound or, you know, an important part that really drives the song. I'll either have it you know, close to center or I'll record two parts and just split them and offset them a bit. Guitarists love recording and they love to record a shed load of tracks with hooks, effects and cool textures. And I love mixing these kind of parts because they need to be spread across the left and to the right landscape so they don't clash with anything in the center. But also they need to be spread so that they can be noticed and they stick out in your mix. Make sure the main parts feel like they're balanced, but electric guitar parts can often be placed somewhere around the edges. Now, I've got two simple guitar tracks here. So it's me playing them, so it's pretty dodgy playing, but just have a listen to how they both sound centered. <laughs> Okay, now check out how they sound when I pan one to the left and one to the right. It makes a huge difference in the track and it leaves so much space and room for other things in the mix. Keyboard parts. If they're lush, stereo, paddy type things, then just leave them as they are, as a stereo file. You know, they'll often be panned hard left on the left track and hard right on the right track, so they're fine. Synth parts are like guitar parts. If there's a synth hook, then maybe it's going to be more noticeable panned to one side. I like to pan pianos off center so it doesn't feel like a lead singer's standing on top of the piano. A lead singer standing on top of the piano is never really a good thing, by the way, so I guess be creative, but always just make sure it's balanced. You can get a good idea of where drums should be, as I said earlier, or where they should be panned by looking in a drum instrument like Groove Agent. Generally, the hi-hats will be panned a bit to the left and the toms are panned around. So if you've got two toms, you'd have one at nine o'clock and one at three. For more toms, just separate them and spread them around. There are generally two overhead mics, which are recorded on a stereo track and they usually pan to the left and to the right. And that's the same for room mics. Strings are another area where we can really take advantage of stereo width. Just have a listen to all of these parts that I've got right here centered. So there's no room for the piano. So now I can pick through them and pan them. And immediately, my sound's more cinematic and dramatic because there's more space for the parts. I can also put some movement in my piano track and have it moving from left to right and back again. And we can do that by automating the stereo panel or drawing in automation data. Pads and synths and effects are a really good candidate for this kind of thing, you know, as are sweeps or drops in electronic music. I wouldn't necessarily be panning things like electric guitar sounds and having them move left and right, but like everything, it's, again, finding balance and being creative. You can add plugins that allow you to automatically pan sound. Cubase has the auto panner, which you can put over the top of a track. You can instantly start messing around with the presets. 
Like find a synth line that suits an auto pan and have it gently move from side to side. When it's balanced, it provides interest and production values to your track. So you can also apply very quick panning for more of a modulated sound. Hey, thanks for taking the time to watch this video on the basics of planning. Please like the video if you've learned something and drop us some comments below just to let us know how you're going with panning in your mixes. Also subscribe to the Cubase YouTube channel for plenty more videos just like this. I'm going to catch you there.